Uh, good morning and welcome to the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board's 2022 Parent Conference. My name is Timmy Brady. I am a parent of three children, uh, two young adults living their best lives not in my home now, and uh, one son who is at TAS in the Integrated Arts Music Program. Uh, in the I'm a member of the Parent Involvement Committee. And in the spirit of taking some risks, here I am as your MC today. <laughs> I am also a photographer with Edge Imaging, so I've probably met half of your children. And after a week of talking over a gym full of kids, I've lost a bit of my voice, so bear with me today. Now, whether you're joining us from the comfort of your own home or here in person, I thank you for being with us this morning. We have a very full agenda today and some awesome presenters, including Dr. Colin King, a panel of KPR leaders from equity, diversity and inclusion, indigenous education, professional services and mental health. Special education and student support services and teaching and learning. To help us begin the conference today in a good way, we would like to call upon Jessica Outram, Principal of Indigenous Education, to lead us through the land acknowledgement. Jessica? Good morning. Tanche, bonjour. Je m'appelle Jessica Outram. Um, Principal of Indigenous Education for the Court, the Pine Ridge District School Board, and a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario with roots in the Georgian Bay Métis community. We would like to respectfully acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga First Nations. We are grateful for our relationship with the First Nations of this territory for their care for and teachings about the land, the water, and all our relations. As people of the Williams Treaty, we continue our journey to strengthen our understanding of our treaty relationship and of how to move forward together in a good way. We acknowledge the contributions and accomplishments of all Indigenous people across Turtle Island, current and throughout history. Today, when I was driving in from uh, Coburg, I live in Northumberland, couldn't help but notice the leaves and take note of the season and how beautiful the colors looked and that they're falling in fall. It's a time of letting go. And I think about the actions that I can take living here and working here and, and being an advocate um, for Indigenous education across the board and I think about what are those things that I've picked up along the way that I need to let go of? What are some of the learnings that may be unintentionally causing harm along the way? And part of what we want to do when we have a land acknowledgement is we want to share these words and these are the same words that we use in each of our schools. They were created in partnership with the Indigenous Education Advisory Committee. And so we want to work together to share these words, and then we want to add a personal connection, a personal reflection, and some action. What are we going to do to bring the land acknowledgement to life so that it happens in a meaningful way, and they're not just words that we say at the beginning of the day? So today, driving in, knowing that we would have this moment together, knowing that we would have an opportunity just to pause, to reflect, to think about, who we are, what is our relationship to this land, to the first peoples of the territory that we're on, and what is the commitment that I can make as part of that treaty relationship. And in KPR, we're really emphasizing right now learning as action. We recognize that there are gaps in our learning and there's much for us to learn. And so we inv I invite you to join me in thinking about the fall and the leaves and, and the idea of letting go and thinking about what are those pieces we need to let go of and what are those pieces that we need to learn. When we enter into using the land acknowledgement in schools, the other thing that I always encourage, we're, like, we're thinking about these are words that are shared with kindergarten all the way through to grade 12. So if I were speaking with a kindergarten teacher or a kindergarten class, 
I would take some of the words out so they would still hear all of the words, but how can we emphasize one or two of the words so that they really understand what they mean? So for those of you that have uh, younger children at home, a good word to focus on is relationship. What does the word relationship mean? And who are the people in your child's life that they have relationships to? And what is the sign of a healthy relationship? And then you can help them through conversation and reflection transfer that over into how we have good relationships with everybody and how we can have good relationships um, with Indigenous peoples in our First Nation communities, our Métis partners, and as well as the Inuit students and families that live within our communities. When I'm talking about the land acknowledgement with older students, we move into thinking about the idea of a traditional territory and the community of the Mississauga First Nations. When those words are shared each morning to the students in our junior, intermediate and high school classes, understand what that means. And have we taken the time to really unpack so that they can imagine a place, they can imagine a people, they can understand and see and visualize that relationship with them. And for adults, I always encourage adults again to think about the land acknowledgement as a way to model being mindful, being present, and taking that time to see this is where we are today in this moment and that's why we we do it every day and sometimes multiple times in a day uh, because who we are and our relationships are always in a constant state of change and our understanding and what we see of them is always in a constant state of change and so i invite you as you look upon these words and you think about that and we enter into this work today to really think about how you got to be here and to think about some actions that you can take and how you can join us in engaging in the learning for truth and reconciliation. Marcy McGuetch, thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for your meaningful land acknowledgement and sharing with us some insight into what is happening in the schools. Next, I would like to invite Diane Lloyd, the chairperson of the board, to bring greetings on behalf of the board. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. What a special day it is for us. This is our 21st annual parent conference. And after the last few challenging years, it is a pleasure to be here in person for those who are able. Uh, altogether, whether you are joining us in person or virtually, this event is always a wonderful opportunity to bring so many parents, to bring so many parents and community members together in support of your children, our students. We've held this event in different schools across our district each year, and I have fond memories of the great conversations, learning and laughter. And I hope th those of you who have been with us as, as past parent at past parent conferences share those special remembrances. Again, I want to say how appreciative we are that you have all joined us on this fall morning through the miracle of modern technology, and we are once again able to bring this worthwhile learning to you, wherever you may be. I believe we have more than 200 registrants joining together today, which speaks to the lasting value of this long-standing event. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and Parent Involvement Committee who organizes and sponsors this event, we thank you for sharing your time and your continued engagement in public education. Um, I just want to, in, in recognizing our fellow trustees, to introduce them at this time. Uh, so. I'll start with uh, Trustee Angela Lloyd. She is the vice chair of the board. Angela, Trustee Lloyd uh, represents Cavan, Monaghan, and Autonomy South Monaghan. Thank you. Ger and Gerald Dummer. Uh, we also have Terry Brown. Uh, Terry Brown uh, it represents the Coburg, Port Hope area. And I know there are three towns. There's uh, Haldeman, Alnwick, and and Hamilton, thank you. I obviously don't have a list of what, where their representations are. Trustee Jane Klaas in Janinga. She's the same township. 
Same townships as Trustee Brown. Trustee Rose Kitney represents the city of Peterborough. Trust, uh, Trustee uh, Gail Nyberg represents um, Clarington. And Trustee Steve Russell represents Peterborough. Trustee Abraham, did I miss you? I'm sorry, please stand up. Trustee Abrahams, Clarington. Thank you, and, and thank you to all of you for, for being with us this morning. I'm confident that we'll enjoy our time together. This conference is one of the most enjoyable moments of the year to share for both myself and my colleagues on the board. Our Director of Education, uh, Rita Russo, is a, uh, has a professional engagement this morning. She's unable to be with us, unfortunately, but she's asked me to convey to, to you all, on behalf of Senior Administration, her sincere thanks to the Parent Involvement Committee and staff for making this learning opportunity possible for the last 21 years. These last couple of years have shown us that together we are better. When schools work in partnership with parents in education, remarkable things can happen. To every parent or guardian out there, please accept our sincere thanks for your role in being our most important educational partners. You have taught us the importance of ongoing open communication that is responsive and proactive. We thank you for choosing KPR and for allowing us the opportunity to serve you and your children. We want to acknowledge that you, our parents, are our students first and lifelong teachers, and by being actively involved in their education, you make their success possible. Please stay committed to this partnership and support us as we work to inspire all our students to excel in learning, succeed in life, and enrich our communities. Now, I'm very much looking forward to our keynote speaker, Dr. Colin King, and his address on helping support our children and ourselves. In building, in building resiliency and challenging ourselves to risk a bit more each day. As our lives become less restrictive after so many months of caution, I have to confess to feeling a bit unsettled and questioning, and I'm sure our children feel the same way as we all, as we all adjust. I know Dr. King is going to help us help our children build confidence, confidence and security in managing their stress and being comfortable with risks in learning, in their learning in life. In closing, I would say once again that I'm excited for our morning together with you all, and I thank you again for all that you do to support your children and public education. Thank you. So in just the, in the brief intro there, I, I talked a little bit again, the challenges over the past two years. Again, we know that we haven't been in the same boat, even though we've been in the same storm through the, the pandemic and, and really how hard that's been. Right, on, on all of us in, in ways that are kind of known and perhaps kind of unknown as part of that. And, and Dr. Tracy Villanacourt, who's been looking at some of the mental health impacts on uh, children and teens. Uh, this is uh, one visual from one of um, her kind of work here from Statistics Canada, really shows again kind of that variability. So I'll quickly go through this here. The, the blue line shows about adolescents reporting their mental health as about being the same. So you can see here kind of September, November 21, about 56%. Um, the red line there is uh, teens reporting their mental health as being worse or much worse, about one in five. And also about 22% here, one in five of teens reporting their mental health as being better or you know, perhaps kind of somewhat better. Right? And I think that's you know, a message here about not making assumptions about, again, the experiences that kids, teens, families have gone through over the two plus years. And to know that this has probably al already changed because some of the teens who reported perhaps feeling a little bit better initially about, I don't have to go to school, I don't have to manage perhaps some of these demands that make me anxious or uh, that can be challenging for my mental health, again, are, are now kind of back doing the things they need to do and again, might be struggling now. So again, I, I take from this and certainly some of the evidence that's coming out right now is that you know, has the pandemic uh, had an impact on mental health? And the answer is yes, but also it really depends. And certainly in kind of my circle of parents and uh, families with young kids, we know that it's been exceptionally hard for them, right? This is, uh, I'm an active Twitter user here. This is uh, from Dr. Goldman. She's an environmental engineer here, right? So we can see on the left-hand side, right? Calm, cool, collected, 
speaking on CNN and right just off the Zoom screen there, right? Kind of the, the lived reality, right? Kind of the chaos kind of all around her, right? And hopefully that's what we can take, you know, again, from this kind of pandemic moving forward is, is that curiosity, that compassion and collaboration with others there about not knowing what everyone's going through, right? What's in their kind of backpack that they bring to work or school every day. Knowing that again, just kind of off screen there, again, things aren't kind of what they seem. And again, we know again around the impact around kind of mental health for adults as well. Again, that there are increased rates of anxiety and depression symptoms again for adults. Again, particularly in households where there's kids. And again, you know, boy, those two years uh, on my end were extremely difficult. And, and I'm sure again, um, the, the families you know or support. Uh, that that was the case too. Dr. Dylan Brown from the University of Waterloo uh, looks at uh, family stress and again during the impact and really talks about kind of three main themes of pandemic related stress. Certainly kind of the economic impact. Again, if you're kind of laid off, uh, not having regular streams of uh, uh, income, uh, relational stresses, not being able to see our loved ones and friends or perhaps kind of spending more time with relationships that can be stressful. And lastly, some of the pande uh, pandemic specific stress as well, which of course is a big theme. And Dr. Brown talks about this idea of kind of stress kind of getting inside kind of the family unit, where again, kind of kids and parents and caregivers and others, again, kind of play off some of those stress dynamics kind of over time once it's kind of in kind of the family. Unit. And, and again, we know, again, perhaps you're kind of coming here today because uh, you yourself or you might know someone that's struggling or perhaps kind of a kiddo. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about this uh, really for the rest of the morning here is this idea around kind of self-regulation and how do we kind of promote some of these skills to deal with big emotions related to worry, <laughs> anger, stress, and what do we kind of do with those kind of big feelings? And that's really this idea of kind of developing kind of self-regulation skills. I'm going to go through this kind of fairly quickly here. Um, but this idea that self-regulation is, right, be able to kind of manage your kind of emotions. Uh, to manage your emotions and kind of what you do that's, again, aligned kind of with the context and kind of situation. And it's not kind of not having emotions. Again, that's not kind of healthy either. But this idea of it being kind of in sync. Right, to kind of be able to manage your behaviors, thoughts, and feelings as you're kind of working towards that goal, and to kind of bounce back when there's kind of frustration or failure or kind of setback. That's kind of the idea that we're going to be talking about today in, a, in kind of a less technical way. Um, I love this definition here. Self-regulation is kind of when the brain and the heart go walking. <laughs> right, They're kind of walking together in unison, one not being kind of too far kind of ahead, but working together as part of a team. And we know that these self-regulation skills are, are developmental in nature. Right? There's a host of different factors that can impact their development over time. And, and again, if you uh, um, are seeing kind of our kindergarten year one students, right, right in September there versus, uh, you know, six months later and, and uh, a year later, you can see, again, kind of that huge growth in self-regulation uh, skills, uh, knowing that that really continues until kind of our mid-20s as part of that. Right? So we know there's developmental differences. We know there's temperamental differences there as well about kids who are kind of born into the world being a little bit more sensitive perhaps than kind of others, or for whom those emotions run a little bit quicker and a little bit more hot perhaps than kind of other kids as part of that. And even within that, we know that there's profiles of individual skills. And again, that we really have our own kind of unique kind of fingerprint with respect to how we kind of manage emotions. And again, the set of self-regulation skills that go into that. And lastly, when we think about kind of a social e uh, ecological context here as well, right? And again, knowing that there's kind of the child or the adult kind of right at the center, but again, kind of building out from the circles there, about being in the context of a family, a neighborhood, community, and boy, if you think about the outer levels there, about the pandemic, of course that's going to have an impact on around self-regulation and how we're doing. Right? So if I think about even kids kind of within the same family, about having all these sets of differences there and in individual characteristics that are setting the stage for how we can support them, uh, knowing that it's going to be different for each uh, kiddo. 
if I think of uh, my two boys in particular, right, kind of my oldest here, we were at uh, Home Depot here a couple of years ago, right, see some of the scary Halloween stuff. Oh, Dad, come, come take a picture. You know, this, this looks great. Um, you know, yeah, this looks awesome. You know, look how scary he is, right? And kind of that temperament piece, right? Kind of excited and uh, particularly about new things, right? Kind of my youngest, not so much, right? And and some of those temperamental differences among these two kids have continued to play out that way over time about how they experience the world, and ultimately how myself as kind of a parent is going to help support particularly some of those uh, moments when there are kind of bigger feelings, knowing again that they're at different kind of starting places as part of that. We're going to be talking about some of these ideas around kind of explicit skills that we're building on, around self-regulation, right? And, and this is where we often like to be, at least on a parent side, right, is, is the last building block around regulation. Right? We, tell, we tell kids all the time to kind of settle down and calm down and turn it down. Um, but knowing that the, that last step around regulation is really built on a host of these other skills relating to being able to detect kind of emotions, understand what that emotion is, to be able to label it, uh, express it to others. And then that very last stage, which is, you know, because I know that I'm feeling this way and the strategies I can use, I'm going to do something now to help me, again, kind of regulate and, and make that feeling of perhaps a little bit more manageable. Right? Again, a really complex set of skills here uh, that we can help promote. So what we're going to be doing is, again, in talking about these skills here, is I'm going to talk about kind of four main ideas. Again, whether you're a, an educator, a, a caring adult, a parent or a caregiver here, that we can begin to find these opportunities here to, again, promote these skills in kind of an explicit, intentional way uh, for kids. And the first one here, this idea we're going to be talking about, is about being able to kind of label our feelings, externalize them when they become kind of too big or something that's getting in the way, and to be able to educate kids about kind of how kind of emotions work. Right? And this idea of developing emotional vocabulary with kids. And, and this is where, again, I feel like we're kind of leaps and bounds now as educational systems and uh, helpers here about doing this as early as, again, kind of kindergarten, right? About building that emotional vocabulary about how we're feeling. Right? For a lot of kids, we can begin to, again, externalize some of those worries or those feelings when they begin to get in the way. So again, rather than kind of Colin's feeling anxious right now, we can talk about how kind of anxiety's uh, given Colin a hard time right now. Or again, boy, it really seems like kind of anger is, is getting in the way of kind of making some kind of good choices on your end. Again, it's not about me, it's not about my behaviors, but the field kind of separates. We have a, a bit of room here um, to help support kids. Right, to be able to understand that emotions kind of get, can get in the way, right, when they become too big, but they're not to be feared, that we can kind of manage them. And that it's not always at the kind of the moments when things kind of go wrong, right? When kind of that volcano explodes, but other times when I could see that you're anxious or worried or frustrated. And what did you kind of do there to help again, kind of bring that kind of feeling into check? Oh, it looks like you kind of went and kind of grabbed a book or you did some coloring or you went up to your room perhaps a, a bit to kind of calm down, right? Uh, amazing ways, again, being able to kind of connect the dots and, and build connections for kids. Right, and there's lots of ways that we're doing this, you know, certainly kind of being curious with kids about kind of the emotions that they're feeling at a particular kind of moment in time, right, to kind of listen, reflect back. So it really sounds like you know, maybe, yes, you're disappointed, but perhaps uh, you're embarrassed as well, right, to use a variety of different tools there, again, to kind of bring this to life, to make connections, and to help kids kind of demystify this process about now I understand why, again, you, um, this kind of behavior kind of happened the way that it did, because you were feeling this way, you were having these thoughts, and, and this was kind of the, the behavior or, the, or kind of the choice that kind of came out. No wonder. Again, making those connections for kids can, can really do wonders, again, to kind of build bridges and, again, really demy demystify this process that can feel pretty intimidating at times, you know, for kids and adults. 
So these are, again, just different tools that perhaps you've seen as part of um, your work and, and certainly going through the KPR team's uh, kind of resources here in Twitter and, and looking at some of these resources that are in the classroom. This is very much in line with those ideas, again, building these emotionally rich classroom and, and discussions. As I mentioned, again, making that kind of connection for kids, and, and we do this all the time in some of our work with anxiety about, uh, we know there's often a cognitive uh, thinking component, right, about they perhaps uh, presentations, right, about everyone's going to laugh at me, they're having critical thoughts about me, um, I'm going to therefore kind of not do the presentation, or I don't want to put up my hand, or uh, some other kind of response because I'm having this thought. And again, that kind of feeling, right, about I'm starting to feel kind of worried now. I'm having a physiological response around my, my heart beating faster or I'm finding it difficult to talk as part of that. Right, and that ability, you know, in this kind of triangle here to show, again, those kind of connections for kids. Of, again, now I get it. You still wonder why it was so hard to, um, again, to go to that soccer practice or uh, go to that kind of friend's sleepover because of what was going on at the time, right? And this is such a powerful moment for kids because I'm always sharing about, you know, this gives us a lot of information about a path forward here as well because if our thinking and our behaviors can actually influence how we're feeling, then we can do something different to, uh, for those feelings to feel a little bit more manageable too. Yes, it's really tough right now because you're getting it kind of from all three sides, but the, this is great because, again, it's giving us an opportunity to do something different. And we'll talk more about that. All right, so again, just some uh, different resources here, for particularly for anxiety. Again, ways that we're making those connections for kids. Some great resources here from Anxiety Canada, right, using Chester the Cat about, you know, what are those clues, again, that they might be kind of feeling worried or, or having some anxiety. Similarly, again, going back to this idea around the triangle and, again, showing that degree of kind of influence here, right? Again, I'm in my bed at night. I hear a noise at the window. There's the situation, right? If you ask anxious kids, you know, what are, what are you thinking is happening? Oh, it's definitely a burglar, right? So, so someone's breaking in the house. Um, and, of course, if that's the thought you have, just no wonder, of course, you're feeling scared and you're running to your parents' room or turning on all the outdoor lights as part of that. That makes perfect sense. Right? But if we had some alternative cognitions or thoughts about what's going on, right? it's like just the trees or at my house, it's, it's the raccoons going, getting into the garbage all the time. Right? Again, we're going to probably have a, a different emotional reaction because of that. And we're building these kind of building blocks and connections for kids about kind of how emotions work and how we can have a role in helping kind of influence or kind of manage things. Uh, another tool here, again, just as part of our anxiety work, uh, I believe it's from Anxiety Canada as well, but again, the kiddo on the left-hand side here with the orange, circling a whole bunch of different things that make them worried. Again, a little bit more of a generalized worrier. Whereas the kiddo on the right here, you can see the theme. Nighttime, parents going out, being away from home. Probably that theme around kind of being separated or away from parents. And why I spend a lot of time about this first particular step is, like, I love this quote by Mel Levine, a more informed description, sorry, detailed description leads to a more informed prescription, not prescription medication, but prescription around what are kind of the next steps that we can take because we now know kind of the lay of the land and the context for kids about how they're experiencing these uh, big feelings, you know, whether that's anxiety or frustration. Um, sadness. Again, we can begin to kind of have that real kind of map here about um, some of the uh, contributing factors. And again, those kind of clues and kind of next steps that we can help support. Uh, the next principle here is, again, this idea of kind of building this kind of emotional toolbox. And, and we could spend a whole Saturday here unpacking the whole kind of range of tools uh, that can be helpful in this regard. And perhaps you saw some of those over by the registration tables around uh, deep pit of belly breathing, right, progressive muscle relaxation. But this idea for kids, again, that we need to help kind of brainstorm and identify strategies that can kind of work for you. Knowing that, again, when during our little uh, technical uh, timeout here, um, perhaps, again, there were things that you were thinking about as, as tools that you use to manage those big feelings, right? Maybe it's a coffee break. Maybe it's uh, connecting with a friend. 
maybe it's taking stepping uh, back from that computer and, and going for a, a walk. Because we want to help kids develop, again, kind of that range of strategies that are appropriate for them and at kind of different points of kind of regulation. Because we know, again, when kids are at tens, right, that frontal lobe is offline and we're not going to have a lot of good problem solving skills there. But again, there may be some opportunities when kids are starting to get kind of frustrated. Right, and, and this is where, again, going back to, you know, kind of my own journey as a psychologist and a parent, too, of, of you're okay or calm down, rather than, again, doing that regulation for them and not providing those opportunities, is, is we want to engage kids in about kind of the dialogue about, so what could we do? You know, what might kind of work for you? Uh, where can we kind of bring in some other ideas here, again, to kind of map out strategies that can help you with some of these big feelings? Right? And, and boy, I feel like this is such a, a key piece of, you know, boy, that kind of kindergarten experience for kids, right? Is we're kind of regulating you know, individual kiddos and, and also kind of as a classroom. Right? So again, I won't spend a lot of time here, but the Everyday Mental Health Practices, School of Mental Health Ontario, um, have a, a collection of great different resources here that I know are being kind of used in KPR schools. And this idea here, again, on the right-hand side, that, again, strategies are going to be appropriate for different points here. Right? Again, being able to kind of talk it through when you're at a stage five probably isn't going to be helpful for most kids. And I know that was a conversation and dialogue I'd have kind of with my oldest there as part of that, about what's actually kind of helpful for him versus what I think is helpful. Right? Dad, I just need a couple minutes and then we can talk. Okay, okay that, that sounds like a, a good plan. Um, and I just want to pull, again, a, a couple kind of examples here. This is the Jessica O'Regan, a, a Thames Valley educator, used with her per, uh, permission here. But again, you know, this idea of creating calming spaces as a proactive strategy. And again, kind of using the strategy right before we're kind of at the five, right? I just love that kind of intentional, kind of explicit connection that this is kind of working for that student, right? It may not be kind of for all students here, but again, that they're using this in kind of a proactive way and, and practicing that skill. Right, that, that's a, a wonderful kind of illustration of, of this kind of idea really kind of in action. And, uh, and again, some examples here, again, building that kind of emotional toolbox, particularly kind of on the anxiety side, we often use kind of more, I call kind of detective kind of thinking strategies, right? Kind of that cognitive reappraisal, but detective thinking strategies, that's about kind of looking for evidence, right? Engaging kids in the pro process, right? This is kind of the worry thought Right? But what do you think? Right? We, we know the story that uh, anxiety is trying to tell us. Right? But what are your thoughts here? What's kind of the evidence? Right? What's a more helpful thought as part of this situation? Right? And, and this is why I love this particular example here. Uh, you're asked to give a talk in a class or perhaps a, a keynote presentation. Right? So here's the, the worry thought over here. Right? Everyone's going to laugh at me. Uh, the more helpful thought for this particular kiddo is it, it will be over soon. Right? This is not, I love public speaking or presentations, but you know, this is something that you know, it's not going to last forever, and, and I can kind of do it. Like, that's a, a great uh, reframe there. And again, what we're ultimately kind of looking for is we're building this kind of emotional toolbox, and, and again, in that kind of example there in that kindergarten classroom, right? It's really that ability to kind of self-monitor, to identify what you're feeling at that particular moment, Identify those next steps and strategies that you can use or that kids can use to bring that, um, again, into a more kind of comfortable space, right? So kids are not, you know, saying this, right, when they're starting to get frustrated, when they've, um, you know, Fortnite's turned off or, uh, right, kind of their siblings kind of taking their favorite Pokemon card. At least that's what's happening in my house anyways these days, but... Right, this idea that, well, I'm starting to notice that I'm getting frustrated in this particular moment. Um, so I'm going to kind of uh, take a five-minute break there, and then I'm going to come back and kind of talk to my brother kind of more calmly about kind of my concerns and kind of what's going on. <laughs> right, we know kids aren't kind of doing that, but that's kind of that skill set and idea that we're helping promote uh, over time. Right, again, we know lots of adults perhaps, again, for whom this is still something, right, we're still kind of working on. So this third idea here, and this is where we're going to spend probably kind of the most time here in kind of the last kind of 20 minutes, is about finding opportunities here to continue to kind of practice skills. 
in real kind of intentional, slow ways that again kind of make sense for perhaps your particular child or the, the class that you're helping support. Um, and again, this is the kind of idea that we've been talking about kind of emotions are something that can be kind of learned to be managed, that are not scary things that we need to kind of avoid. And that's where we know over time, particularly around anxiety, but for other big feelings there as well, is that, you know, that intentional avoidance of these strong emotions actually strengthens that emotion over time. Whereas that intentional practice and bringing that emotion into the room and again, doing something different with it actually weakens that intensity uh, of that emotion. And that's really what some of the research has, has continued to show, particularly around kind of anxiety treatment and anxiety support here is this idea around exposure, or I've kind of rebranded on my end about supportive risk-taking. That supportive risk-taking part is such an essential ingredient uh, for kids to learn that anxiety is kind of not overwhelming, that this is something I can do. And it's really such an essential ingredient there that we can use for other kind of big feelings and experiences. Uh, but it's often something that we just that don't sometimes have the time or perhaps that kind of proactive stance to be able to kind of do. Right? And that's where that kind of personalized plan there becomes kind of so important for kids. Right? So uh, with uh, thanks here to, to Gary Larson and the far side here. Right, this is often the situation I feel that, right, as parents and helping professionals, we often feel kind of stuck between. Right, so this is, uh, this is going to gymnastics, kicking and screaming, and everyone's crying as part of that process, or we're kind of uh, mopey and sad at home because we didn't go to kind of gymnastics. <laughs> right, those are the kind of the two doors there that often feels like we're kind of stuck between. Right? And, and what I'd like to propose is actually there's a third door there that's kind of not being shown that as part of kind of our intentional work and the foundations of skills that we're building with kids up to this point, again, that we can show them that there's another option there as well. Again, that's the kind of the, the trap in many ways that we often get kind of stuck into. And, and this is again, probably kind of my far kind of fav uh, favorite uh, visual here as part of this work. Right, so perhaps you're uh, get asked to give a presentation at work, or perhaps it's a, it's a keynote, perhaps. Right, and we know that uh, right as you're getting closer to that work presentation day, right, kind of up goes that kind of anxiety. Right, it's getting you kind of mobilized and, and kind of ready for the day. You're getting kind of notes ready. The challenge being that again, if you're a kid with an anxiety disorder or for whom you know anxiety has really started to get in the way, is again when you're at that kind of peak point. Again, that's when we're kind of doing things that because anxiety is in charge, right? Again, we call in perhaps kind of sick to work that day or we give our colleague the opportunity to do it even though we kind of really wanted to, right? And it works the same way for kids there too is again, in that kind of moment when we pick in kind of a detour around that kind of anxious experience, right? Those big feelings around anxiety kind of drop, right? So there, and I have to admit there, there was a brief moment there with the tech difficulties where, oh, geez, I wonder if we're not coming back online there, <laughs> right? Of, of my anxiety just uh, dropping as, as part of that, right? But we know, again, for kids who really struggle with anxiety is we're going to be going up that kind of mountain the next day too, right? Because, again, the, the test has been moved to the next day or they're going to see that friend at school for, for whom they had a conflict with or that presentation's been moved and up they go come to that mountain again. Again, this idea about the third door is, you know, how do we help kids get over that kind of hump there, knowing that once we do, it's a bit of a slow ride down. Again, it's not like things are kind of really easy at that point, but again, we're really on that way for these feelings to feel more manageable. And the example, an idea I have to use with kids is that the idea of kind of jumping into a cold pool. Right, the, in the initial moment of just kind of how oh, overwhelming it is and that desire to kind of get out of that experience, right, go jump in the hot tub or grab a, a towel. But if we stay in that kind of cold water, dunk our head, swim a little bit, right, it, it feels a little bit more kind of manageable or it feels like the water's warmed up, right? And nothing's changed as part of that. It's not like someone's turning on the heater or dumping buckets of water. It's that we've kind of learned to tolerate and kind of manage some of those feelings. And again, this is kind of the, the quintessential uh, question for kids, though, is about how do we figure out kind of what level of kind of the cold water here? 
right? Is we're not looking for the polar bear dips in Lake Ontario there in uh, you know February, uh, but at the same time, you know we're not going, we're not perhaps uh, staying in the hot tub where things are really comfortable, and that's where we can use you know tools like this or other types of uh, visuals there around anxiety, but for other big feelings too is helping kids kind of gauge how intense that kind of feels. Right, for what I'm doing kind of practicing and, and homework kind of with families as part of our work, you know, I really like that kind of three to four range. Certainly kind of initially, right? It feels a little bit difficult. Oh, I prefer not to do this. But because I'm building kind of our emotional toolbox, we've got those strategies at the ready. We built in that motivation. We're gonna do it together. Um, that we can get over again that kind of hump together. So again, what we're looking for over time here, again, with that kind of practice and again, the intentionality and, the, and that safety together, because um, I really believe exposure is something you do with a kid as opposed to to a kid, right? Again, you're working together as part of that. And again, that's why building this idea of kind of a ladder is kind of so important together is we're gonna go again, go from kind of a model here where we're doing kind of detours and not getting that habituation and learning that piece it's not scary again, being able to kind of go over that kind of hump there. And this idea that over time, right, these kind of big feelings, right, whether it be anxiety or anger and frustration too, become kind of more manageable. Right? And I think for a lot of some of our kind of uh, real big feeler kids for whom they've had a lot of experiences of going one to 10, one to 10, one to 10, right, those emotions can feel, they can bring a lot of shame to those experiences. Right? It wasn't a, a knowledge deficit. It's not that they don't know that they shouldn't have said that or hit their sibling or done something else. It's that it was too big. It was a performance kind of challenge. Right? Kind of kids do well if they can. And that definitely applies for adults there as well. Adults do well if they can. And that's where, again, with this intentional practice piece over time, is again, you know, those feelings don't feel as perhaps scary as they do kind of initially. So this is where, again, you know, there's a host of different kind of tools and visuals out there, but uh, we can begin to kind of map that intensity of those different feelings, again, whether it be kind of anxiety-based or other big feelings, again, kind of with kids. You know, so what would type of situation or conditions here would, would be kind of a 10, right? What would be a seven? What would be a two? What are some of those naturally occurring things that throughout the day, uh, we can begin to kind of build into kind of our ladder here, again, using this idea of kind of our toolbox alongside to be able to kind of practice and come over that kind of hump, right? So again, you know, thinking about again, uh, during our little uh, tech uh, timeout here, right? Again, there's probably things that you've learned, again, whether it be over the last couple of weeks here about strategies that you just intrinsically know now about what you need to bring yourself kind of back into equilibrium. Right, for to, to feel things, for these emotions to feel kind of more manageable. And that's where, again, setting up these, some of the, uh, these opportunities for kids are such kind of a, a crucial kind of important step that sometimes we, we don't have a, as much of an emphasis. And again, over time here, so what we're trying to kind of promote is this idea, again, it's, it's not a fix, it's not a one-off, but over time here that these, these feelings don't feel quite as intense and they perhaps don't last kind of as long. Again, emotions are adaptive, emotions are kind of natural, but when they're kind of getting, uh, feeling too big and kind of not working for us, that's where this intentional practicing uh, can be kind of really important. And, and again, celebrating some of those small wins kind of for kids. Again, so whether it's, you know, I'm always, uh, um, when we're measuring some of this work as, as part of our kind of clinic work, right? We're, we're looking at, again, kind of time around kind of meltdowns, right? So again, we've gone from kind of one hour, perhaps down to 15 minutes. Like that, that's amazing, right? We've gone from uh, holes in drywall to pillows being thrown to proactive, again, kind of taking breaks because they're starting to get frustrated, right? Again, we know that this process takes time and and that's where I'm so encouraged by the environments and the classrooms and the conversations we're having now with kids because uh, these are again essential kind of life skills that are really gonna pay dividends uh, for everyone moving forward. Um, so the one caution I would kind of have here is whenever I'm kind of mentioning about 
practicing and intentional exposure or again the supportive risk taking is that I always feel that there's a bit of an urge sometimes to go uh, too fast and kind of too far initially. Again, thanks to Gary Larson here, so I'll read this out. Uh, Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, and the dark. Right, our little uh, friend here in kind of the locked uh, door here probably won't be coming back for session number two. And, uh, and again, this idea that this is a collaboration uh, that we do kind of with kids. Right, that's built on that foundation of relationships and trust. And again, exposure is something we're doing kind of with kids because they want these emotions perhaps not to get in the way that they kind of once did. Again, we're working with kids because, uh, again, um, he, he's probably not coming back uh, for future conversations around this. Right? And again, that's the experience that kids often have, right, about these emotions feeling way too intense to be able to kind of talk about or again, a lot of shame and blame kind of attached to that. And that's why those kind of early foundational pieces, being able to talk about emotions, build that toolbox, is it, so important. So what I'm going to kind of show you here in this kind of next clip, I'm just going to skip this for a minute here, is I'm going to show you a wonderful example here from Anxiety Canada. So you'll see a video here uh, being done. Um, her name is uh, Millie. Uh, she's a teen. I don't know if she has anxiety or is just a, an actor, but she does a wonderful job. And, and you'll see some, in, some of the intentional practicing that she's been doing with her psychologist as a way of kind of learning about kind of her emotions and, and about anxiety specifically. Um, so as we watch this short clip here, I think it's just two or three minutes, I want you to pay attention to some of the learnings from Millie of what she's kind of learned as a result of this kind of experience. And see if you can kind of notice the actual setting or conditions under which she's kind of doing that practicing. So again, it comes back to this idea of kind of being prescriptive and intentional and, and some of this anxiety work. We'll pull this up here. Hey, it's me, Millie. So the doctor says that I have panic disorder, which means I get these really intense anxiety attacks that just come out of nowhere and she says it's the reason why I don't want to go back to the mall or any of those other places where I've had an attack but she says that it's important for me to stop avoiding those places because that just feeds my anxiety um, my mom found this stuff off the internet that says one way to deal with a panic attack is to purposefully bring on the feelings of panic like being dizzy and sit with them but I I think I'm just gonna do that with my counselor <laughs> right now I just want to go back to the mall so today my mom is gonna take me there hey I'm here at the mall with my mom uh, my goal is to walk around the outside of the mall until I start to feel less anxious. Here I go. Hey, I'm back. So I did it. I walked around the mall for about 20 minutes. It was hard, but especially at first, but I just tried to breathe normally and I just kept walking. And I told myself that anxiety is not dangerous and these feelings won't last forever. So I, I did feel better. I, get, I suppose I'm going to have to uh, keep going with this. Uh, maybe I'll come back tomorrow and do it again. I think I'll sit on the benches at the front entrance of the mall with my mom. Uh, right now I can't even imagine doing that, but I didn't think I could come here today, so who knows? Bye for now.
I love that clip. Every time I, I watch it there, it brings kind of a smile uh, on my face here again, kind of seeing that again, kind of new learning piece, right? Kind of that, um, that real kind of nugget of confidence there, again, kind of that Millie's having as part of that experience that we can continue to kind of grow uh, again and through her kind of practicing. So again, if we think about kind of the, the details of her particular uh, practicing or exposure in kind of that moment, and again, the experiences in her new learning, Right, we can see that it was really kind of personalized to her and again, what was kind of that just right level for Millie. Again, it wasn't kind of a 10, it wasn't being at uh, Costco kind of for several hours perhaps, or maybe that's just my 10, but uh, again, it was kind of personalized to her particular setting and, and where she was at. Right, you can hear some of the messages here about you know what was happening, right? I can, you can see kind of the education piece. It was hard at first, especially, but I kept walking. You can almost hear perhaps kind of going over that kind of curve, right? And again, some of this new learning piece around kind of emotions and anxiety more specifically, right? That it's kind of not dangerous, that it won't last forever. I can do this, right? And again, this kind of newfound confidence here about I can kind of do hard things, right? Again, maybe these kind of past emotional experiences perhaps aren't kind of telling the whole story of, of what I'm kind of able to do. And for me, that's kind of so exciting when I begin to see these kind of new learnings for kids um, around anxiety, but other kind of big emotions too of, of you know, hello friend, uh, nice to see you again, and uh, uh, I'm gonna help kind of regulate us together as part of this. I'm just gonna go back here really quickly to show you again kind of an example here as well. Again, finding that kind of just right level here, again, kind of for kids. So. Uh, this is a particular kiddo I was working with, uh, again, kind of a, in a school with her uh, educator. And again, a lot of worry here about making mistakes, about uh, anxiety getting in the way of kind of contributing. So we were able to put together a ladder here. So again, she felt really comfortable around uh, doing kind of math questions and other kind of factual work at, at her desk. Right kind of type of work where there's kind of perhaps a, a yes or a no or right or wrong kind of answer to that. But again, kind of going up kind of the ladder here where there was that possibility, again, for kind of more risk or to be wrong. And again, this was a wonderful illustration, again, with kind of the educator being on board and us and with her parent as well about finding opportunities here, again, where she could practice some of her kind of tools and again, have some of this kind of new learning along the way. And that really leads to kind of this, oh, just a, another quick example here. So this is again, um, an actual sheet here from another practicing situation for a, a team. And again, this, we hadn't created this. This was something that just naturally happened for her. But again, a beautiful example of kind of that curve there as well, right? Of, I just need to kind of last about kind of 12, 15 minutes here and things are gonna feel kind of much easier. At least when we kind of know that they're again, entering these situations feels a lot more manageable and something that um, she's able to do. And this really leads us kind of to this fourth idea of, you know, and again, it's uh, such an honor to be here again, 21 years of uh, building community and partnerships with schools and, and families and uh, caring adults here, is we just know that it, it, it's always taken a village, but we especially need that village now, right? About to be able to build bridges across kind of caring adults, be able to share some of those knowledge and strategies across setting. Some of our work at the clinic is around producing reports and other you know, real child-friendly um, tools and summaries that can go back about, here's the strategies we're learning. Maybe we could find some examples, for, again, at home and school to continue this practicing. Right, to celebrate that growth and success, right? Again, going back to kids do well if they can and Again, what's that kind of next inch for kind of each kiddo? What have we kind of learned along the way here? Yes, kind of things aren't kind of perfect, but again, um, that things are becoming a little bit easier and more manageable over time. Right? And, and as needed to be able to kind of advocate for that support and understanding about, again, here's kind of what's going on for my kind of particular kiddo. Here's some of the types of experiences I think that we need to help kind of grow and promote some of these skills. Right? And again, this is where, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how do we create some of these flexible communities 
that we can continue to kind of learn and practice kind of these skills together. Right, again, and we're in a space right now where I think there are a lot of kind of common challenges that perhaps we're kind of navigating, again, in our classrooms and at home and in the community too. You know, how can we build some of these kind of practicing examples together to be able to share that learning? What would kind of a ladder look like, again, for some of the classroom settings around kind of anxiety or worries? Um, I'm working with a couple of educators right now about actually, how do we kind of build up some of these experiences over the course of the year with kids? And that's really exciting uh, to see again, you know, intentionally knowing that probably, you know, it's probably essential for these two or three kids who have uh, high levels of kind of clinical anxiety, but probably beneficial for all kids as part of this process. Right? How can we intentionally kind of practice this and be explicit in the tools and strategies that we're promoting together? Uh, so I'm going to end on some resources here in a, in, a, in a minute, but again, some of these kind of ideas as kind of takeaways is, again, from all this kind of continued kind of pandemic, you know, this curiosity about what's going on, compassion for meeting kids and adults, kind of where they're at, and that kind of collaborative piece. How do we, again, kind of do better together? Thinking about these four skills to be able to label, externalize, educate emotions, build that emotion toolbox together, actually find some intentional practice opportunities and build that community again as we're sharing across settings about what's working and kind of where we're at. And overall this message here that you know we can kind of do hard things together that again what an emotion that felt scary or really overwhelming in the beginning is not kind of the, the final story that we're at. And again looking for that kind of third door here when often we've been stuck in right two kind of choices sometimes that don't kind of work well kind of for anyone now. So just before I wrap up here, I just want to share a couple of great resources that uh, we have shared with parents. Currently around self-compassion, boy, just in this space right now for parents and families, Parenting Through the Storm, and Douglas, a great read. Um, if you know a kid who's kind of neurodiverse, uh, Deborah Reber really has a great book there just about um, navigating, again, kind of the tricky landscape with kids who are wired a little bit differently. On the self-regulation side, again, kind of can't go wrong with uh, Dr. Shrewd Stank uh, Shanker and Dr. Ross Green and some of the wonderful mental health literacy books there, again, to continue to promote this idea of, again, growing those kind of social-emotional learning skills over time. And uh, lastly, School Mental Health Ontario, again, such a wonderful example of, again, the resources and collaboration being done across the province, Children's Mental Health Ontario, and this real gem here out of the States um, called Pandemic Parenting, put together by two moms who are also psychologists, uh, put together in these very digestible uh, video clips and podcasts about the, the, really the lived realities and space that we're navigating right now. I highly recommend that too. And very lastly there, our particular clinic here at the Faculty of Education in London, we're often running webinars and other events here, again, for families and caregivers. And we have an in-person event there on November, also on a Saturday morning, around anxiety in particular. We describe this as kind of our anxiety crash course uh, for parents around parent-led strategies. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to sign up on our website there and we can send you the news. Um, but, uh, and just kind of wrapping up here, just really want to thank uh, everyone for your patience and again, all the hard work that you're doing in your classrooms and homes right now. It really does take a village and, and so pleased here to, to be part of it. So, so thank you so much for being here. Dr. King. Great presentation. Supporting children as they navigate change and manage stress and anxiety in their daily lives is particularly relevant in today's day and age. Um, I think a lot of us can look back at our own childhoods and, and recognize some of the signs that we children and uh, some of those same struggles. But maybe, like me, mental health was not something that we talked about in the 80s. It just wasn't. It was like a dirty word. So I'm really appreciative now that we're much more open about talking about mental health. 
And Dr. King, you've given us a lot of valuable information and advice to reflect on and some new tools for our parent toolkit. That parent toolkit's getting uh, pretty big, eh? At this time, we're going to open up the floor for some questions. I've got my first question here online. So at what point do parents need to seek help for anxiety in their child? And what is considered healthy versus unhealthy anxiety? Yeah, no, thanks so much for that. I think that's such a great question and I think a real common one that I think parents are often trying to navigate, um, knowing again that anxiety is a healthy kind of normal emotion, right? It, um, anxiety propels us, it can be really adaptive. I was joking with my wife this morning because I, I sent the PowerPoint presentation and saved it, saved it on three USB keys as part of that, right? Again, it's kind of mobilizing, it gets you kind of moving forward. Um, but what we know about anxiety though is that when it's no longer kind of working for you. So kind of my rule of thumb is I often think about kind of the four D's around anxiety. I'm often thinking about kind of the amount of distress the child's in at a particular moment. I think about the duration, about how long it's been going on, right? We know there's lots of anxiety jitters about, you know, the first day or first week of school as part of that. But if those feelings are still there into kind of late October, November, right, maybe that's a sign that something else is going on. I think about disproportionate to the situation or context or other kids at that age. And then lastly, I'm also thinking about kind of how disruptive kind of those big feelings are too of, when it's getting in kind of the way of day-to-day -day things uh, that the kids want to do. Again, I'm <laughs> reflecting on personal examples here from kids, right? Uh, going to birthday parties or gymnastics, right? Doing the things that they'd want to do. That's for me a point here of maybe we need some additional help there to, uh, to again, kind of build our collective toolkit. Hey, I've got another online question. Should you approach anxiety differently for children with autism or other special needs? No, oh, that, that's such a great question because we know I think for a lot of our kind of neurodiverse kids, um, you know, anxiety is kind of part of the package <laughs> that kind of goes together as part of that, right? Um, for me, I think it's about kind of um, going back to kind of that principle number one about the curiosity and uh, being able to kind of educate and, and work out together there again, you know, what's kind of anxiety because you know, things are difficult for me. Again, you know, perhaps a kid with kind of uh, who learns differently for whom, you know, again, reading might be hard. And again, this is, you know, why I'm kind of anxious versus, you know, anxiety that's perhaps getting in the way because it's kind of anxiety. So I often think about, you know, what's more of kind of a worry versus kind of what's more of sometimes a challenge or kind of problem that way. And sometimes that kind of metric can be helpful as a way of figuring out, you know, what are some of the things that we actually need to manage or perhaps kind of problem solve versus, again, kind of use perhaps a little bit more of an anxiety kind of base lens. Anyone else in our audience? One sec, we just can't, the people online can't hear without the mic. Hello. Go. <laughs> um, I have a daughter in grade 12 she's starting to look at university and academic sort of stripping school out of all of these experiences on her academics. She's finding it really challenging to school and her encouraging her to she keeps saying expense. I've saved for her education since you were I said it's it's my money, not your money, so <laughs> might as well go. But I didn't experience that. It's a hard thing to kind of to especially if you and pretty supportive. I said, you know, if you don't like it, you can come. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's a great question. Thank you so much for that. And I think it, you know, it's it's really 
you know, illustrative of, again, this kind of space and time that we've been in where, again, perhaps, you know, some of those other kind of formative, perhaps experiences there haven't been there to the same kind of degree. And so, again, you know, one of the things, again, I'm kind of thinking about is, again, going back to kind of that latter idea, again, you know, is, um, again, we're often in situations where, again, kind of ones or tens without kind of the middle ground. So, you know, I think about, you know, if there are opportunities for, again, some of those kids who are kind of making those next steps around, um, again, be visiting kind of open houses or perhaps kind of spend a weekend or uh, to, to grab a, a bestie there over the weekend and explore the campus or thinking about some of these other next steps there that, you know, may not perhaps kind of be anxiety inducing in the same way, but again, it's promoting some of that confidence here that, you know, maybe I can kind of envision, again, kind of being a way to, um, in ways that perhaps I kind of didn't before or, um, again, I, I know lots of kids who are taking that kind of additional year there is, again, getting some other experiences before that kind of next step, too. Um, so I think that's, you know, maybe some of that process around collaboration and brainstorming about, you know, how do we know or how can we know for sure that this is a decision that she either wants to or perhaps doesn't want to do. And, and again, maybe it's some of those other kind of intermediate experiences at the university or college and some time away there that can help kind of provide the answers. Uh, knowing that, again, in the, at the end of the day there, um, I'm always saying to kids, you know, or, or teens or adults too, again, if you don't want to do something and that's a decision you're making, then, you know, then, then that's kind of great. But if it's anxiety making the decision for you, you know, perhaps we might need to kind of look at that. So, again, maybe that kind of process there of finding some of their experiences can help kind of figure out, again, is this something I kind of want to do? Or perhaps, no, I'm just kind of more comfortable and I'm okay with, Again, kind of doing different arrangements too. So yeah, so I, I think that's a great question, and I think um, I think she's uh, in the space of a lot of other young adults there trying to kind of figure out and kind of fast forward, uh, imagine what some of these experiences uh, might be like. So, our next question: I have a teen. Next question from. All I have a teen who often uses anxiety as an excuse and definitely exaggerates her anxiety versus the I don't feel like it. Where does the line get drawn without minimizing when you can be certain it's motivation and not? Mm, oh, that, yeah, that, I think that's a great question too. Again, trying to kind of figure out, you know, the different pieces there, know that, yeah, motivation's a, a part of it and, and anxiety too. You know, I'd really be curious going back to, again, that kind of first principle there about, you know, maybe we actually need to kind of learn more about some of these situations here of which, you know, anxiety kind of is too much. So perhaps kind of unpacking some of the details and understanding perhaps how anxiety is working and, and perhaps it's not kind of being exaggerated. It really is kind of that difficult. Um, conversely, you know, or kind of really kind of irregardless, you know, maybe that's giving us some... Um, at least some information here about some of those next steps, right? And teens are, teens are, I feel at times can be quite tricky, but again, being able to kind of work together there too, again, going to some of those elements around, you know, when anxiety is getting in the way, are there other pieces here around low motivation or anxiety that, you know, we might need some kind of additional support there as well. So for me, I think going back to the collaborative piece, really being curious about how anxiety is kind of working or not, working in, in that particular kind of situation and can we build some kind of ideas around kind of next steps uh, working together any other questions from the audience oh we've got one up okay i just have so we have two boys they're two and a half as far as we know they're typical um but they both have like the very the zero to ten sort of um and whether it's from anxiety or anger uh the emotions responses are big how do you deal with when the behaviors from those big emotions are violent in the mm -hmm. moment because our reaction is just no don't do that right yeah. so but they say not to do that <laughs> yeah Oh, totally. Well, and I, and I really do feel that, uh, again, when we're kind of at those tens in those moments, again, that's kind of where safety and parents are often kind of taking charge. 
as part of that, right? It's kind of reactive. It's going to put on our oxygen masks and you know, try to kind of diffuse things as much as we can. You know, given the kind of their young ages as part of that, I do wonder about, again, kind of looking for some of those themes or perhaps kind of triggers kind of over time, knowing, again, it's going to probably take a while to figure out, again, kind of the constellation of uh, some of the different kind of triggers or contexts or situations that kind of go into that. And uh, as kind of developmentally able to kind of be able, once we have a little bit about some of the themes, perhaps, again, to kind of bring kids kind of into it. Um, again, that's where some of the work by uh, Ross Green, collaborative problem solving can be great, right? Some of those entry points about, I've noticed that, um, again, situations like this, when we're getting ready to leave or putting on uh, uh, winter clothing and things like that, that that can kind of bring on some kind of big emotions and, and looking for some opportunities there kind of moving forward about, you know, again, some of the proactive pieces or ultimately how we might do things a little bit, perhaps kind of differently kind of there as well. So I think you're kind of at the really kind of early stages. Again, you know, kids won't be able to perhaps kind of vocalize again what's going on, but to be able to perhaps over time build some of that kind of knowledge together for some of the themes about that might give us a path towards, again, kind of doing something different. The next question I have, I think, is a question we were Um, how can parents support children with anxiety as they prepare for major life transitions? What are some of the coping strategies transition to high school? Yeah, the, that's a great question. Again, some of these kind of big steps, um, I really noticed some of the changes that are happening, certainly at kind of a university or just post-secondary level more generally, but also at a high school level where we have opportunities for grade eight students to come visit the high school or experience uh, a morning of what it's like to, to go through classes or go visit their, their locker and the space as part of that. So some of those, I think, big transitions is perhaps kind of not just kind of taking for granted that they'll happen, but again, how do we find some other opportunities there to kind of reduce kind of the, the step or again, kind of the mystery and demystify that kind of experience uh, out of that kind of that process. So that's kind of one idea, again, picking about some intentional opportunities there to experience it, not in kind of the full volume, but again, getting a bit of exposure and practice to that. Um, the other, I think, is about setting kids up for some of the conversations that we're having around, right, these kind of big transitions and, and that, you know, that there will be kind of ups and downs and roller coasters as part of that process, knowing it's a different environment and context. And again, that's something I think we're doing at least, you know, speaking about a post-secondary level, I feel like we're doing kind of much differently now about normalizing the struggles about being at kind of first year, perhaps, and then the new learning demand, being away from home and navigating social pressures. I think it's kind of preparing kids for kind of that messiness that comes as part of new learning, and that, that's okay, that we'll use it as part of information moving forward to uh, really add to our, kind of our, our understanding. So for me, I'm always kind of complicating some of the messaging for, for teens and families about, right, it may not be kind of all great, but also might not be all terrible either, that there'll probably be ups and downs, and, and on both ends, we can kind of learn from those experiences. Okay, one last question for today. Just like everything else. Health, at least I know area. We're looking at eight times. So as parents, what time are we to get our child in to see a mental health professional? Yeah, that's a wonderful question too. I, I think you know, and certainly I don't think it's all that different down kind of London way either. And you know, for me, I think some of the it really starts with again not being able to pour. I think from kind of a an empty cup on our end too or just how difficult that can be as part of a parent caregiver watching someone you love struggle as part of that process and, and you know, having some compassion for where we're at in that process too. And that's where, you know, Ann Douglas, some of her work is, uh, is wonderful in that regard, is just recognizing some of kind of the, the impact and toll and that we're kind of doing our best. It's not a reflection of, you know, our, what we're doing or kind of not being good enough that way. Um, so that's kind of, certainly kind of one idea, starting with some of that compassion and empathy for ourselves. 
Uh, and the other, I think, is about, you know, some of the different resources, perhaps, again, that this idea of kind of parent-led approaches, is that there's a, a lot of kind of new emerging ev evidence and research, and particularly in our area around anxiety, too, about, you know, what we know kind of clinically can be helpful, uh, can be helpful, again, kind of from the parent kind of side of things, too. But not necessarily they have to go down that road, but being curious about, you know, what are some of the types of learning and, and again, great steps kind of being here today as part of that too, because a lot of this, you know, messaging is it looks a little bit different kind of what we're doing kind of clinically with kids, but very much in this kind of same idea there as well. So um, I think just looking at perhaps again, some of those conversation starters that we know that can be helpful. And at first, and I guess kind of ultimately about kind of being compassionate and listening. We know that being that supportive, uh, validating ear on, on the parent side can do wonders for kids when they're struggling. So being kind of compassionate, slowing things down, being reflective um, is really appreciated by youth, teens, and, and adults alike. Thank you again, Dr. King. We appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise with us. This time, uh, a few minutes we'll take a short break we'll turn we will be joined by the kpr panelists for further exploration of today's theme within our local schools and communities we will also announce the winner of the three packs so i don't know about you but i like winning stuff um, so in that prize pack there is a kpr lawn chair a t-shirt and a voucher for a self-regulation course that's awesome uh, and that is through the Merit Center. All our attendees today were actually automatically enrolled, so you didn't miss anything. You didn't fill out a ballot or anything. And we're going to ask that you be mindful of time. About a 10-minute break now, so back here at 11.15. Thank you. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm Greg Kidd with the school board, and it's my great pleasure to be the moderator of our panel discussion this morning. And what we would uh, like to do is just explore a little deeper some of the themes of our conference around supportive risk, specifically to talk together a little more about what that looks like in some of our schools. I'd also like to begin also by thanking our registrants who submitted some of our questions and themes that we're going to work through or with our guest panelists. So thank you you all for joining us and I'm just going to do some quick introductions left to right. We have Anne Marie Duncan, Superintendent of Special Education Students. Jamila Maria, Superintendent of Education, also with the Inclusion. We have Jennifer McAmore Parsons, Principal Teacher. Jessica Outram, who is principal. And certainly last but not least, Dr. Dean Swift. Executive Officer of Professional Services. Just being with us today. So, absolutely. So, I think we're going to just jump right in. I know that you've had a little bit of chance to think of this. I'm just going to pose our first question so that everyone can understand what's going with this. The question is in your view, what does a supportive environment risk taking? Area of focus, and from the perspective of maybe Emory will want to start with. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, as Greg said, uh, my portfolio is special education um, and student support services. And thank you, Dr. King, for, for really reinforcing the messages that we certainly are trying to instill in our parents, um, guardians, families, students, um, and our educators in our schools around practicing the skills, right? So our board action plan calls us to create the conditions that meet our students' unique needs and support transitions and open doors to new directions and destinations. So those are our marching orders. So we know that this starts with approaches that are good for all students in the classroom. So it starts with designing activities wherein each student can achieve. Each student can see their identity validated and they are receiving ongoing feedback for improvement. 
Educators will also feel supported to take risks when we're providing them with the professional learning opportunities, which they need to create these best practice learning opportunities for students. We know that for some of our students, more support is going to be required in terms of accommodations, such as specialized technology. And these accommodations allow them to take risks in a what we call a scaffolded manner, or certainly I like Dr. King's ladder analogy, um, where we're helping to build their confidence through the tools that those particular students need to be successful. For a few students, we will actually be adding um, for them some additional human resources staffing, like educational assistance, for example, child and youth, um, and some of our students who also require some of our professional assessments and our staff, like psychologists, speech language pathologists, mental health clinicians, behavior support assistants, um, and specialized itinerant teachers for deaf, hard of hearing, blind, low vision. So all this being said, one day students are going to leave us for post-secondary um, and we need to be fostering independence. Post-secondary can be the work, post-secondary can be whatever option is best for the student following and whatever the family is deciding uh, works for them and that student. It can be college, it can be university, it can be a whole host of things. So we need to be at the school level helping students to practice the skills which they need to be independent. Um, they need to be safe and supported at school and I know certainly my colleagues are going to speak more to what that looks like uh, from a mental health well-being and equity lens. Um, and we, are, in my department, we have the, what we call tier two and three, which are the sum and the few student approaches, right? Where we need that more specialized support. So we actually have what's called a wellness plan that can be developed for students who are struggling with, for example, anxiety. And that's created in collaboration with the student, the family, the mental health clinician at the school. A success story for us is our learning and life skills program. We have 55 of these classes across the board. They are for students who are not following the Ontario curriculum. Um, they are learning life skills, social skills, basic numeracy and literacy um, in order to be successful post-secondary. Um, and certainly that program has provided that practice and those opportunities for, for students to take those risks to be more independent to the best of their ability as they leave us at age 21. We're, we're very proud of those programs and, uh, and very happy to see how our students are out after, after secondary school. And I'll pass this over to you tomorrow. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And uh, I do want to uh, just build off of what Anne-Marie has said and certainly um, Dr. King, I appreciate uh, the one slide that struck me, of course, is uh, the one about bravery and community. So I think those two words are essentially at the core of uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, talk about what we are doing uh, to create environments that are supportive and safe for our students. So when we talk about understanding in our board action plan, we talk about uh, really understanding and knowing our learners and identifying uh, what it is that is at the core of their being. And we create those environments that are identity affirming. What we're talking about is really having educators and administrators know your children and know who sits before them in a classroom. So really connecting on a personal level and understanding where they come from, what their background is, and really what their home life is like so that they can address needs within the classroom um, that, they, that they have and do that in a way that is, uh, as we refer to it, culturally relevant and responsive, meaning that students come to school and they see their lived experiences reflected in the environment. So that would be on the walls, in the resources and in the teaching strategies themselves. So it would be a very inclusive environment that we're creating um, where a child feels that they can be comfortable to be themselves. Um, 
and certainly there are a lot of success stories. And uh, and I think going back to what Anne-Marie said, I think one of the biggest pieces that we're very proud of is that we are creating those safe and supportive environments for our staff. So staff gain access to professional development that helps them be brave in the classroom, bring forward their own stories. So that gives um, permission and life to the stories of our students. And community, we talk about bringing in the community. So our parent community, such as yourselves, our other communities that are both cultural and religious, they all have a space in our schools, and we certainly um, enjoy the benefits of having those partnerships and making sure that our children feel that they don't have to hide any part of their identity in school. Um, one of our biggest success stories, uh, I think, is our de-streaming of grade nine. Certainly, um, as you know, it was quite inequitable uh, when we streamed students. Uh, there was uh, data that supported that students in the applied stream uh, were not accessing the same opportunities after high school. So in KPR, um, we certainly took on that challenge, de-streamed mathematics, and uh, certainly uh, had a high level of success. And I can tell you that over 90% of our students passed the course and were successful, which is even higher than any other district in the province. So uh, it's pretty amazing. And, uh, and I think at that point, um, we say to ourselves, okay, we are working on this. We are now de-streaming all of grade nine, and we'll take some of those strategies that we incorporated and we'll utilize those for the rest of courses. So um, the other piece is the learning community that we create. So all of us sitting here um, work together collaboratively every day and create programming for students. So having the equity, diversity, inclusion portfolio means that I work with everyone. Um, and certainly that, uh, that all of our work is, uh, is coming from that lens of identity affirming uh, experiences. Okay, I'll pass it over to Jen. Thank you so much. And so much of what you've already shared connects with those conditions that can set the, the tone and the capacity for our students to uh, absolutely enjoy taking risks, feeling safe enough to take risks uh, while they're learners in our classroom. So we, when I was thinking about this prompt, I was thinking about just setting conditions through routines and, and a few of those from a purely teaching and learning lens. Um, uh, those conditions are that students understand learning, not just what they're doing, but they understand the purpose of their learning so that they can find meaning in that. Um, that they know that we have high expectations of all of them. And that's part of our um, our, our learning and work around uh, culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy is that all students can achieve uh, and, and the belief and our actions that match that. That we, that we try to encourage students to think with creativity and innovation. Um, that happens through in a safe way for students when they know the criteria that we're going to be using to assess their work, uh, support them in their learning. And the best situation happens when that criteria is co-constructed with the students. Certainly the educators know the curriculum and they know what the, uh, the key learning should, what they're hoping it will look like. But co-constructing that with students gives students voice and it, it allows them to, again, make more uh, meaning from the learning they're engaging in. But it's lovely when learning goes off without a hitch. <laughs> and more often than not, though, we, we encounter mistakes and errors and, and, and creating the conditions in our classrooms where those are welcomed, that they're seen as opportunities to reflect and take, make a change the next time, that it doesn't just end in that moment of error. It's, uh, it really is truly a chance to say, OK, what's that look like next time? Um, and then I, I, I think I heard uh, Dr. King talk, speaking about this in terms of that just right like um, place of challenge for students as they start to learn. Um, sometimes we call it 
in a short form, a Goldilocks moment uh, that we find just the right amount of challenge for students that they engage in some productive struggle. And when we say that, it's a edu, edu word that we, but it, it is exactly as it describes room and space to be okay being uncomfortable not knowing yet. And then uh, being supported both through the environment and the tools that they have, but also the questioning and support from the educators to say, it's a, we're, we are, we're going to get to the solution here, or we're gonna be able to engage in this learning and push through this challenge right now that's making us uncomfortable. Uh, so we, we're working to offer that because without a condition of being a little uncomfortable as a learner, just a little bit, uh, the, it's challenging for students to want to take the risks because they, they if they're not used to having to take a risk uh, and and try that in their learning. So um, part of that that productive struggle too is monitoring, and we we saw a lot of this in terms of, of Dr. King's message and in, in self-assessing and not self-evaluating, not judging myself for what uh, I can and cannot do yet, but the the way I'm responding to that productive struggle. Those are those those prompts that educators can, can support students to be monitoring and checking in. What, what am I feeling right now? And we do have educators who do this as a tier one intervention and tier two and, and, um, and just inviting students to take a pause. Where are we right now? Much like we were invited to do when we took that pause at the beginning of the day today. I think the only, the, the other component that is a condition that we hope is is supporting the routine of making a classroom safe for risk taking that I would like to highlight here is just the importance of social emotional learning that's coming through our curriculum. It's, it's a part of, of all of the revised curriculums and, and a couple of the key areas is that managing and perceiving emotions, so managing my own and perceiving those of the, the students that I get to or a, students and staff that we are working alongside, but also the thinking critically and creatively. Uh, how do I respond when I'm challenged to do that? And, and um, making sure, lastly, that this isn't just, these, these kind of conditions aren't only for students, uh, but they're also for staff, and uh, that, we, that we have a common understanding of what our big purpose is together. I think a couple of successes that I've seen uh, in, in our KPR schools, uh, we, in the last few years, we've really been thinking about the learning environment in our classrooms and thinking about how do we create spaces where students are comfortable learning. And uh, you may have heard uh, students say, oh, we're doing this flexible seating thing. <laughs> and uh, the, that idea is is intended to create um, comfortable spaces for students to uh, challenge um, or find themselves as learners and in, 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 in encouraging students to be aware of where do I learn best when I'm learning this? And so we've had a few, and, and it's been challenging through um, our COVID uh, restrictions to, to employ this as, as thoroughly, and we see educators excited to bring this kind of experience uh, back into classrooms uh, as, as students go, you know what, when I'm doing this particular subject, I do so well to be able to talk to my, my classmates. When I'm doing this particular subject or this type of learning, I know I'm gonna get off track. I'm going, to, I'm going to need some more quiet space. And so how do we make every space a learning space? Uh, that's part of including students in, the, in those decision-making processes and building their capacity to recognize that in themselves so they can take risks in learning and, and feel supported. So we see that creating more independent and autonomous learners, uh, which is always one of our goals as edu educators uh, across Ontario. Ready? I've got, I've got one, but is it on? There we go. <laughs> um, so in Indigenous education, uh, we believe that Indigenous education is for everyone. And so, like some of the others said, we work very collaboratively with every department across the system. And when I think about supportive risk taking, first we start with the students. And in the board action plan under Enrich Community, there's an emphasis on the importance 
of connecting to authentic voices. Um, there's an importance in the board action plan um, around truth and reconciliation and on students seeing themselves represented in the system. So one way that we help support Indigenous students specifically with risk taking is we have a team of Indigenous student workers and they are itinerant. There's four of them. They go from school to school in a day. They are each assigned regionally and they might support 30 to 50 students kind of depending on the caseload that they're carrying. And they go into the schools and they meet with one student or sometimes two or three and they support them by offering them cultural teachings or they can be a caring adult. They can join them in class and it's it's a supportive way for us to offer students an opportunity to see themselves represented in the system and to connect culturally with somebody at school. The other program that we have that helps to do this is we're lucky to have an Indigenous graduation coach program too. So we have two sites, one at Bowmanville High School and one at East Northumberland Secondary School in Brighton. And they have a designated space, which we've called the Wabanong Student Center, which is the Sunrise Student Center, because every time you enter, it's a new beginning. And uh, we have a designated staff member who's there in the room and helps work with students to map out their pathways, to support them in the transition from grade eight to grade nine or from grade 12 to post-secondary, and then is also there in the day-to-day -to, -day to help students see themselves reflected and, and represented and so that they can take risks in a supportive way where they're maybe not feeling alone or they're not feeling like their voice isn't heard or seen or valued. They're having this opportunity to do so in a really meaningful way. When I think about supportive risk taking, I also think about our staff and how, you know, one of we've got our seven principles of Indigenous education, and the first one acknowledges that there are gaps in our own learning. This wasn't something I learned about when I was in school, gaps in my learning, even as an Indigenous woman. And so we have to, as a department, with our team of consultants, as well as our First Nation liaison, Melody Crow. And we're also very lucky to have a superintendent of Indigenous education, James Brake. So as a team, we reflect on this a lot. How can we help staff close the gaps on their learning and provide the support so that they feel a little less vulnerable and will take those risks to do the, the learning and the leading that's necessary in our schools? Because things need to change in our schools. There's a lot of work to do, but it begins with us doing the learning and starting to close those gaps. When you look at the principles of Indigenous education, the other word in that first principle is the word urgent. There's an urgency to it. And I always say that doesn't mean we need to go fast. It just means we need to act now. We need to take one small step and then another small step. And as a department, we have worked together to build out a little project we've called the Passport to Reconciliation. Um, and every month you can access this on social media at KPR Indigenous. And every month we have a different theme. So September was Truth and Reconciliation. Um, October is Film. So this month we're inviting each week there's a different task that we invite. Individuals can do this, families can do this, classes, whole schools are even engaging in this. We have some of our trustees who are engaging in this learning. I've even seen some um, reports come in from parents who have taken this on to do this. So this is really, we've made it really accessible this year for everybody to begin to close those gaps. And so as you sit there today and you think about our topic of film, do you know the name of an Indigenous filmmaker? And if not, this might be a way for you can, you can learn from that. And you can meet one through some videos and some links that we've shared through the resources. And so by providing the resources, by providing a weekly invitation to do something that might take 15 minutes, I feel that that is providing the system with a way to take those risks in a supportive way. Bogging up here. I'm getting excited with all the information. <laughs> I'm very passionate about this. I don't know if you can sense that. Uh, but it, it does help to take those risks and to do that work. And uh, if you have any questions about it at any time, please reach out to us. We love it when we're busy and we have a lot of questions because that means that's a sign of engagement 
and where there's engagement, the next thing that happens is change. And we're doing this as a tool for social change. Miigwech, Marcy, thank you. Yes. The amongst passionate educators. We have a very dedicated team. My job with the mental health portfolio is to think about strategic moves across our system to keep this current conference. The last umpteen years, perhaps a bit uh, of her of knowing the importance of thinking about health. We're lucky that we have and an action plan that really centers wellness and mental health. Our job is to promote mentally healthy classrooms and work environments for all staff to really focus on some of this learning. So you talk about yes. And part of our strategy is to bring that learning to every classroom and every student in every school. How do we think about the social emotional learning opportunities? Uh, for students to model those everyday practices, to build up their toolboxes full of strategies, to be able to understand and name their emotions, understand the signs when they're under stress, to be practicing and learning different ways that they can breathe deeply, they can take a stretch, they can take a moment when they need to, they can find calm spaces. One of the important things about building the supportive environment around them is our caring adults. And we always start the school year, and we certainly did this year, particularly returning back to school, to think about how do we build those relationships and knowing your students, knowing the children in our classrooms and within our schools and their families. Building relationships is huge in terms of this. Our kids need that network of support. They need to know who they can go to and who they can talk to and who can help them solve a problem. We need to build as many supports and caring healthy relationships for our students as we can, peer to peer, adult to peer. So as a parent, start to think about who in your family circle your children also go to for support and connect with other than their parents. Is it their sibling? Is it an aunt or a grandma who's important? We think about that within schools. Who are the support staff, the educators, the principals? Building those relationships are so, so important. So students feel safe. They know they have someone to go to if they're concerned. So those are some of the things that we touch on, and we're going to continue to do this work. And so that all our students are supported as building their toolkit, learning to be resilient, and learning to problem solve, right? We're not going to solve the problems for them. We want to prompt them. We want to coach them. We want to be that caring adult with them to help them on their journey apply their skills and solve their problems. So that's another thing as a parent you could think about, about, you know, what are the skills your child has when they come and they're upset about something? How can we help them solve the problem? How can we say, what can we do here? What can we try? And if it doesn't work, that's okay. That's learning. What can we try next that's going to help? So we can be there to coach them and support them. Okay, wonderful. Sorry for the mic is hot now. Thank you. So appreciate all that context you provided. And I wonder though, I, it, you've touched on an area that I think maybe we would, could explore a little more at the end. I'll start with is Dr. King certainly um, uh, illustrated rising levels of stress and anxiety among school age children that we're seeing. And I wonder maybe if you want to continue on the vein that we started where, speak a little more about how do we see that manifested maybe in schools? And also more importantly, for those here in online, how can we help parents with some, with some more tangible ways that we can help prepare students for school and those experiences? And maybe, uh, maybe explore that ground a little bit and anyone else chip in as we go along it'll be welcome thank you so i think that we um are seeing some students who are still settling back into school still trying to make their friends their peer relationships settle into a more structured learning environment that perhaps coming back to school has challenged them a little bit about 
And, you know, I think that we are seeing some emotional dysregulation, right? And, and there's some opportunities that we're, we're taking as educators to think about with our support staff and our educators. What are some of the coping strategies that we can help model for them in the classroom? And that's okay. That's part of natural child development. Um, we want to be able to support them where they're at. We want to help them name their emotions, understand what's going on inside of them and tune into what's happening. Think about ways that they can um, apply a strategy and a skill so some of the tangible ways we're doing that is around social emotional learning and bringing in practices into the classroom, helping educators have some of this conversation, model some of the uh, strategies that students might try. We always want to think about what is the student bringing? What is their identity? What works for them? Because there's no one size that fits all. So as a parent, get to know your child and what works. You can, if it's a, you know, if it's a, a younger child and they, you, they seem to go to from zero to 100 really, really quickly, it might be sitting with them and holding their hand and taking some deep, deep breaths together, you know, and just helping them settle and then start to talk about, hey, what got you so upset? What is it that we can try? How can we fix this problem together? What are your ideas? And try them together. So I think that's part of trying to meet our students where they're at and our children where they're at. There are lots of different coping strategies. I know we have um, some examples outside in one of the, the parent tables of different coping strategies you can, you can use with your children. For older children, sitting with them, listening, really validating. All feelings are valid. We may not see it the same way or think it's something to get upset about or mad about really listening to them. Tell me about why that made you mad. What's going on for you? And really listen. Oh, that's really tough. What, what, what might you do? What's one thing that can make you feel better? What's one action that you might need to take to problem solve this situation? So slowing it down, meeting them where they're at, helping identify and name those feelings can really, really help. These are some of the strategies working with students in the classroom and on the yard and in the hallway and at lunch and getting onto the bus. You know, our mental health, we take it with us wherever we go. And so we want to have all those little teachable moments and staff available and caring and kind and trusted people uh, in your young people's lives to help them through those moments that are difficult and to celebrate all the joys as well, right? The happy moments as well and reflect upon those. So really being intentional about how we're teaching social emotional learning and about mental health and literacy in school is so, so important. And having the opportunity to have conversations with young people at home about how they're doing, who they connect with, who, who's the caring adult in your life? Who do you go to to talk about? Who can help you at school? Having those conversations and exploring that. And if you feel like things are not going well for a young person and they're coming home upset or distressed, have that conversation with your child's teacher. Let them know, hey, they're coming home or it was a hard day or, or maybe this really helps us at home. Maybe this would help the student at the school. Because you know your child best and we're here to collaborate with you and to be a team and a partnership. Uh, and sometimes the person might be having a struggle that the school is not aware of. So we can have that communication because we're here to work together uh, to help our, our children grow. You took a lot of the things I was going to, 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 to bring to the surface. Greg, is it okay if we go into some of those specific areas? Okay, so uh, the, the I can't emphasize enough that some of the key words I heard you say were partnership, and that is such a key part of our board action plan. It's also, I'm going back to something that Jamila said, knowing our learners. And as, as we think about trying to reduce um, stress related to or anxiety related to significant transitions or big moments in schools uh, like starting school in kindergarten or uh, moving on to secondary school or post-secondary as we heard about earlier is those those opportunities that all of our kpr schools offer in terms of supporting transitions uh, having educators uh, available and a part of that transition experience. 
uh, often having students also be a part of that uh, transition experience, people who have lived that transition already. Um, uh, we know that uh, hearing from other children that this is something that has gone well for them and, and the experiences, shared experiences, uh, is, is a great way to um, uh, encourage and support that uh, student's awareness that, oh, somebody else has gone through this. I felt that and, and that they were able to persevere through, again, building relationships and, and finding people and, and um, others that you can trust. Um, I think that in terms of uh, ensuring that there are some practices beyond those experiences, so yes, great, attending the, the orientations and the, the preschool uh, uh, meetings and uh, taking advantage of opportunities for open houses and, um, and following uh, social media for those those organizations, those schools uh, that your that your um, your child may be transitioning to, but also um, offering students a chance to visualize and and what, how they're going to picture themselves in those environments, and if they can't yet, what are the questions that they have that are still staying with them in terms of uh, I don't know what that part would be like. For instance, a grade eight going to a school with lockers for the first time. I don't know what that's going to be like. Um, offering them, drill, really drilling down uh, with uh, students. And educators in our schools will do that. Our grade eight teachers are amazing resources to support uh, uh, children in making those transitions. Those are those people that uh, we hope have built those, trans, those uh, trusting relationships with students. And, and, and they know the, their students and can say, you know what, a lot of students feel this way. Some of the things we do to help them feel more comfortable. And if you think specifically about um, other events in the school, I'm going to just tag into EQAO even as a, as a sometimes a stress or an anxiety inducing uh, time for students. Again, through the school year, educators are, are working with such intentionality to provide students with the ex learning experiences. And again, meaningful learning experiences that they understand and feel confident in. I know how, fill in that blank, of, uh, in, in terms of their literacy or numeracy learning. They have a variety of tools that they're encouraged to use and then continuing to allow them to have access to those uh, so that those are familiar experiences. EQAO measures the curriculum. It, it reflects back on the curriculum. And uh, so, we, we have given students the tools and the experiences they need to uh, show their best, uh, put their best foot forward and feel confident in taking on that challenge and talking most of all about the way students are feeling ahead of time is, a, is another strategy that we see both in schools happening. How are we going to manage that? EQO even this year actually introduced a social emotional learning component at the beginning to support students thinking about how am I going to, am I going to use box breathing at this time if I encounter a moment of, of discomfort and, and how will I respond to that? I'll use these tools that I'm comfortable and familiar with. Hello? Yeah, three mics. So everyone's doing well. There is a bit of a lag, so bear with us. Thank you. I just, I'm also conscious of the time. I know we were pushed back a little bit with uh, some other uh, uh, delays earlier on, but I'm wondering if we might just move to the last area and everyone could just open up and chime in because I think it builds on what sort of what we've been talking about, about in some tangible ways that parents can help students. And really what we were wanting to touch on at the end is, um, you know, what, what would we share with parents as we, you know, continue to navigate our school year and really as we return to a more normal setting in school, right, after a number of years that, uh, that was quite markedly different. So, you know, that, that these last two ideas really work together in terms of uh, helping prepare and, and what, what are some quick takeaways, some easy takeaways that we could share with parents. And I would invite Jamila or Anne Marie, Jessica, anybody wanted to begin some of those, that thinking, and then we could all just kind of weigh in as, as, uh, as we move forward. Thanks. Well, 
Does it work? Um, so I, I would love to get into that, but I feel like I have to jump back to what Jen said about uh, trust and relationships. So I think one of the biggest things that I would encourage uh, parents to do for their children is to try to find that caring adult in the school. We have all of our adults are caring, but there is one specific adult that often children go to and feel safe with. And if you feel that your child does not have that person, I think it's critical, critical that you have that discussion with your child's teacher, with the administration, because a caring adult will make the difference for every child. And certainly um, when we talk about building trust and we talk about that reflective environment, so when we talk about culturally relevant and responsive, if I am a child that comes to school and does not see my culture or my family reflected, it is really hard to feel that sense of belonging. So as parents, I would encourage you to be vocal and to be connected to the school and give us ideas that will help your children succeed. Because as Deanna said, we're all partners in education and we do wanna work with you and that community connection, that parent connection is really, really important. Um, something that I wanted to highlight too is ask your children about their day. And I know this is not unique and not new, but when you ask your child about their day, talk about some of those pieces that are happening for them. Ask the question, how do you feel you belong in the classroom? What are some of the things that make you feel special when you go to school? and help them navigate what they need and to be a self-advocate for what it is that they need. We talk about calming spaces, talk about areas, uh, flexible seating. Um, we also have prayer rooms. We have um, areas that are, and, and certainly Jessica can speak to this, that are very compatible with indigenous ways of being and knowing. Smudging is encouraged in our schools for students. Uh, we want to bring in those cultural pieces that make students feel safe and cared for and that they can feel that they're representative of their own culture and not feel as though that uh, they have to hide that piece of themselves. So I think that's my takeaway for parents is to be connected to your school and we absolutely appreciate when you help us understand what your child needs. And I think we want to represent um, all of, all of the, the cultures that we have within our system in a way that is responsive and respectful. So uh, certainly, um, as, as Jessica said, uh, we love for you to reach out. You can reach out to um, the family superintendent. You can reach out to the school. You can reach out to uh, the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Department. You can reach out to any of our departments and we most certainly would appreciate connecting with you. Um, and thank you for your kind attention. I know it's and, and my colleagues have spoken beautifully about that sense of belonging um, from a variety of lenses, mental health, indigeneity, the equity, diversity, inclusion, and also for, from my perspective, with students that might have a special education, um, I think your role as parents and guardians, the families, to be um, raising red flags um, if you're seeing that in terms of struggle with some of the work. And really, we have children that will at school hold it all together and then go home and break down and really struggle with what they experienced at school that day because the work was too difficult or they couldn't access it. Um, so we need to know when that's happening. And of course, when we are seeing it, we will let you know and we need to let you know if it's something that isn't resolved fairly quickly. And then that's when the school principal and the teachers reach out to the departments involved here. We have actually created collab tools collaboratively to really gather that student's story. What's really going on here? Let's get that data that we need to put measures into place as quickly as possible to remedy the situation. That involves all of us here 
and all our departments. And from a special education standpoint, as I said before, there's multiple resources for the schools and for your children who might be experiencing those needs in, in ways that we can support the schools to address them, but also get more data. So please always make sure that you are letting us know any issues of concern that are coming so that that dialogue is open. You are open to that. So, so. Yes. Sure, I'd love to just jump in there and just build off of what everybody else has said. So uh, I have the benefit in my position to work very closely with school teams and with the Indigenous student workers and the Indigenous student graduation coaches. And I get to know the stories of students and certainly the first question is, you know, thinking about relationship and thinking, does this child have or this student have a caring adult? And from there, though, I always ask another question because I'm always thinking about how we can make our schools as much like a circle as possible. How can we build circles around student? So who are the people in this child's, this student's circle? Who would we identify as the people? And then who would that student identify as the people who are in their circle? And then how can we help them have a strong circle that's around them? And sometimes it might even also mean, you know, looking at staff and to staff, like teaching can be isolating and each of the roles can be. How can we help them within schools build circles so that everybody has a circle and is part of somebody else's circle? And that's where we get to that heart of community and community is just so important. So my, my big takeaway would be to just be thinking about, you know, who is in your child's circle? Who do you identify as those people? And who do they identify? And I found in my experience, we often have different perspectives. And that's okay. But it's interesting. It's just good to have that information. And, um, and then when we're, you know, looking at to solve complex things, you know, whose voices are being heard and are we making sure that everybody in that circle has an equal voice? And that also means extending that to the child and to the student to make sure we're giving them the space and empowering them to, to know that they have a voice. Doesn't necessarily mean, because we know as adults, sometimes we have to make decisions for their safety, but at least we know how they feel about it, what they're saying, and we've empowered that. So that would be my takeaway is to think in terms of the circle. Steve McWetch, thank you. Finally, I'm just going to remind us all that we all sometimes have challenges during stressful times, but we also have inner strength and we have passion. So help your child and youth find their strength, recognize their strengths, use their strengths, find their passions. What do they love to do? What fills up their bucket? That helps us during stressful times when we can lean on or drawing or writing or shooting basketballs, whatever it is, whatever their passion is, help them find it. Help them know that that can get them through a hard time turning to something that fills up their bucket, which is so, so important. So uh, we really want to think about that strength-based mod model. We want to think about what kids are good at. We want to help them find what they're good at and what they're passionate about. So really focusing on their strengths can help us get through those little bumpy roads in those times as well. We're supporting caring adults around us that can coach us and remind us of all the coping strategies that are in our toolkit and help us problem solve um, and just be that supportive person alongside their journey of growth. Um, but finding those passions, those things they're gonna go on to learn, they'll take to secondary school with them and um, that, that'll carry them through their life and their mental health and help them be, help them be well. So that would be my takeaway. Uh, thank you, Greg, and all our panelists. Uh, that was a great conversation, and it's nice to really see and understand how the tools and strategies that uh, Dr. King spoke about earlier are being put into practice in our schools and classrooms. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. And I know the context you shared will help many parents support their children and the parent-school connection. Um, 
Thank you to everyone that attended today as well. Your children will thank you, maybe not right away, 30 years from now. Uh, before we end our time together, uh, we've got a prize pack here, and three people are going to win this. Uh, the KPR lawn chair, T-shirt, and the voucher for the self-regulation parenting course with the Merit Center. And at this time, I would like to invite Angela Lloyd, Vice Chairperson of the Board and the trustee for my area, so I'm pretty lucky, uh, to announce the winners and share closing remarks for the conference today. Our time is coming to an end, and I really thank everybody who's attended both virtual and online. Now, everybody wants to know who the winner is. Our first winner is actually in person, and Keoli, if you're still here, I know a few people have had to leave. We will get that gift pack to you and enjoy it. There is still time left in the warm weather to sit outside, be thankful for what we have around us. Our next winner is virtual, and don't worry, we will contact you to make arrangements to get your package to you and that is Lori Marshall. And our third and final winner is also virtual, and it's Claudia Gallo. Congratulations to all of our winners, and thank everybody for what you've done. You know, this wouldn't be possible without the hard work of a lot of people. Our speaker, panelists, everybody that worked behind the scenes to put this together. And when you think of stress and anxiety, I'd say in that little first few minutes where we had our glitches, our two people up there that have worked so hard to put everything together experienced a fair amount of it. So to our audio and visual crew, Jeremy and Angel, thank you for what you've done and thank you for surpassing your stress level. To get a school even ready for something like this takes a lot. And people don't see the people in the background. Our custodians who make sure that everything is clean, the tables are right, the chairs are available. We thank you. And finally, our parent involvement committee who works throughout the year to make this happen. To Timmy who went out of her comfort zone and was an amazing MC. congratulations. And the one person you see, Greg, up front, but the person in the background that has pulled so much together, Shauna Rhodes, you deserve a huge thank you. Now, I know everybody wants to get on to the rest of their day, so be sure to get your feedback in because we want to hear from you how we can make this better. I know I've learned a lot today, and after 21 years, I can't believe that it just continues to get better and the focus that we have on everybody, the value of families, students, staff, teachers, being part of that circle, as you said, Jessica, because together we can have even greater success for our students, regardless of the challenging times. So with that, I thank you all and have a wonderful week.